Buonasera, buonasera. Eh, stasera parliamo in compagnia della nostra... Good evening. Tonight we are here with Elena Silvestri and uh, Giovanni Di Giacomo. Hello. Uh, of course we're going to talk about the shoulder. In particular uh, we're going to talk about some topics, uh, uh, a topic that is going to be shared and tonight we're going to talk about the problem of a shoulder exit in different parts of the world. So we are connected with different parts of the world because we have Mr. Nobu Yamamoto from Japan, uh, Proventure, and Moroda, and Filippo Valenti. Uh, but Giovanni Di Giacomo, can you please tell us something about the topic we're going to talk about tonight? Good evening, everybody. I'd like to thank my international friends because they have to work quite a lot and then there is also time difference. So thank you very much for your effort. Mark uh, Proventure, uh, I know he has to go back to the clinic to work. And Mr. Yamamoto, it's 3 a.m. in Japan. So really, thank you. Thank you very much. I would also like to thank Filippo Moroda and Filippo Valenti. They are a little bit closer to us at the moment. Now, uh, shoulder exit is the term that we use in jargon. We speak about instability, shoulder instability, basically, which is a very hot topic. Uh, there are plenty of studies about shoulder instability and plenty of innovation. So we're going to talk about that, that in detail with four uh, experts uh, from the surgical point of view and also from the research point of view at the e global level. Uh, I know that they've published plenty of articles, they've taken part in many conferences and congresses, they have an enormous amount of experience in their professional uh, history. So, in a while, we're going to give the floor first to Matt Proventure, who will be introduced by Vida. But before we do that, uh, unfortunately, Jem Hesh, uh, a very well-known surgeon, is a specialist of the shoulder and he is very well known because he organizes a conference and uh, I'm a member of the faculty. This is the 40, 40th year. Uh, Jem Hesh will be organizing this for the 40th year in a row. This will be held in Coronado in a few weeks between the 14th and the 17th of June, Coronado, California. They're going to talk about many interesting topics, but uh, in particular, why should we recognize and acknowledge uh, Jim Hesh? And I'm sure he is listening to us at the moment. Well, uh, we owe Jim Hesh quite a lot because many of us, and probably also some of the guests who are with us tonight, well, they really owe him quite a lot. Uh, the work that they do when it comes to patients, well, they owe quite a lot to Jim Hesh because he had the ability to put together many different experts. He started 40 years ago. He was able to look to the future of the possibilities of surgery and therapy of the shoulder. So surgeons from the four corners of the world, Australia, India, Europe, South America, they go, hundreds of them, maybe 500, 600, go to the conference for 40 years. This has been the case. They go there and they are enlightened by the faculty that Jim Hesh is able to put together every single year. For instance, this year, they're going to talk about uh, uh, the surgical treatment of the shoulder. shoulder. Uh, we had the leader with us, together with uh, Professor Valenti, Bassem al uh, who will be there to show the transfer techniques. This conference will be held between the 14th and the 17th of June 2023, and during the conference uh, they're not just simply going to talk to orthopedic surgeons, but also to physiotherapists and also GPs, who represent a very important uh, element in the communication with orthopedic surgeons. They're going to talk about uh, prosthetic shoulder, with particular reference to reverse prosthesis. Uh, there will be Christian Gerber there. They're going to talk about instability, which is a topic we're going to deal with tonight with another expert, Dr. Sugaya from Japan. And uh, another guest will be Christian Gerber and Lenny Johnson. Other topics uh, dealt with uh, during that conference will be, first and foremost, the technology that is used today when it comes to 
prosthetic surgery, with particular reference to robotics and virtual reality, which are now applied not just uh, to the knee, but also to uh, the shoulder, with attempts to try and help patients, uh, in particular using virtual reality. We're going to talk about the success of surgery, but what is even more important, uh, we uh, sometimes learn from failures. So there will be surgeons from the four corners of the world who will show their failures, how to prevent a surgical failure and how to recover from a surgical failure. So I'd like to thank again our dear friend who is in California, Jim Hesch, for this enormous opportunity. It's a growth opportunity for all those who uh, are interested. Enough said. Now, the floor to Vera. Yes, Matthew Proventer uh, is going to talk about the first dislocation of the shoulder, the therapeutic algorithm in antero-inferior instability. Uh, just a few words uh, about him. He's a shoulder surgeon, a knee surgeon as well. He works in the sports field at the Setman Clinic in Bale in Colorado. And he's the author of many articles. He's a professor, he's an educator. He works quite a lot when it comes to orthopedic arthroscopy and he works also in the prevention of accidents. And just think that in the United States of America, he was invited as one of the 20, best 28 shoulder surgeons. He was named. Uh, what's the time uh, in uh, the US? Uh, good morning. Should I say good morning or good afternoon? What's the time there? Good afternoon, Giovanni. How are you? It is 1 p.m., Bill, Colorado. <clears throat> Welcome. I know it's evening for many of you and early morning for Japan, but... Thank you all. It's great to be here and uh, amazing channel you have. It's great to see so many friends and thank you for the kind invitation. This, uh, we would like to uh, remind you, uh, I'd like to remind you that Dr. Provenza was also the medical director of the team of the New England Patriots, a very well-known team, uh, well-known uh, throughout the world and he was also in charge of 75 medical professionals who, of course, follow this team everywhere in the world. Enough said. But before we give you the floor, uh, Giovanni Di Giacomo, uh, maybe we can start with a question? No, no, no. I think the best thing is to give the floor to Matthew Provenza, who's going to talk uh, about the first episode of instability, instability anatomopathological uh, uh, instability, and what is the approach in the United States? Because at the international level, there are different philosophies, right? So, uh, can you please explain to us uh, what is your conservative surgical approach, the surgical time in the first uh, dislocation? You have the floor. Giovanni, thank you. I have some slides to share, if that's okay. We can go through uh, the algorithm on to fix or not to fix. So thank you for the invitation. So why do we fix these? There's a lot of historical data that says you may not need to fix it. There are many times you may not have this, but we know there's a lot of factors that have to be considered. Sex, age, what type of sport, collision, non-collision, but when you're looking at non-operative versus operative, these are the people that you really have to be, be concerned. Males, 3.5 times likely to have recurrence. If you're less than 40, not just 18 or 20, when you look at NEARS and other data, it's actually much higher than that. <clears throat> people are active, they're more active later in life, and 40% will experience a recurrent dislocation when you look at all of every, all the instability literature put together. Now, if you look at Sandy Kirkley's work, which was amazing, in 1999, she did a randomized study looking at whether you should stabilize arthroscopically or treat non-operatively, a first-time dislocation. Guess what? Arthroscopic stabilization leads to better outcomes than mobilization, better WOSI scores, less recurrence. Uh, you know, unfortunately, Sandy passed away in a plane crash before she could finish a lot of her work. But this is many of the things we are seeing now again and again when you look at prospective, now randomized trials 
non-operative treatment results in a high rate of recurrence in those patients that are deemed to have a high rate of recurrence. Males, probably younger than 30 to 40, those that have contact sports or pseudo-contact sports, operative treatment leads to better outcomes. But there are people you can certainly get away with with not treating it. If you go back to John Aaronin's work at the Naval Academy, this is actually where I went to college, and they did a lot of great work in instability. You had five weeks of immobilization. You could decrease your immobilization down to 17%. Now, these were not followed long-term, but you actually could get that down to about 20, 25% recurrence rate. So not bad, but overall, still quite a bit of uh, instability. Well, what about the question of external rotation? And if you look at uh, many work here, and certainly have to thank uh, Etoy and Yamamoto's group here on the call, it's certainly done a lot of great work. When you see what happens in the abducted external position in cadaver, cadaver studies, ear mobilization increases this glenoid labrum contact forces and you get better labrum height, better labrum contact. And so this was thought to be a very good rationale. I will say most of my colleagues in the United States don't use that. Uh, but if you look at a systematic review of high-level studies, whether you do external rotation or scope stabilization, arthroscopic stabilization was, again, a lower rate of recurrence. But it wasn't bad if you did external rotation mobilization. You definitely got a few percentage points increase. Uh, in terms of overall recurrence. The problem is some people wear the sling and don't like the sling and external rotation, and there are certainly some concerns, and that's really I think where we've been in the United States is the sling has been hard to wear, although the science may back it up. But how do you do an in-season athlete, and if it's rugby or football or American sport, uh, many others here, if you have a contact or pseudo-contact sport, is it safe for them to return in season? Well, you probably can get away with it. You can compete. And if you look at Dan Buss's work, he did a great job that said rehab and bracing, coming back after 2.5 weeks, you can get back and you're able to return and complete your season. However, a lot had a recurrence during that season. And that's the issue because uh, if you're going to go on to recurrence, and we're going to talk about recurrence because there is a cost. If you look at the uh, West Point and Naval Academy study, many were able to get back. 45 contact athletes within the season. Most athletes were able to come back, but again, many of these patients did go on to a recurrent uh, or to a recurrence, 64%. So anywhere from 40 to 60 to 70% are going to recur during the season. And you get an average of not just one, but two instability events for that return season. So what are the risks? Well, they're there. And this is what you have to educate your patients and or athlete on. There are, there is a cost to recurrence. And we talk about this all the time. We fix ACL surgeries in the knee all the time. We don't let them go back to play and go back to sport. But maybe because the, we don't walk on the shoulder or pivot on the shoulder, we let people go back in the shoulder. And I'm not sure 100% why. But if you look at this very good study from Takeda and all, and all is 167 shoulders, more instability episodes, very clear association with greater bone loss, greater incidence of osteoarthritis, and you had more soft tissue lesions, more extensive labrum tears, more uh, alpsa tears, more extensive labrum lesions, all of these if you had more than one recurrence. And if you had primary again versus recurrence, what about the hill sacs and bony lesions? Much higher, more hill sacs, more bone loss. And we know that there's more bone loss. Giovanni has shown us this along many others, that bipolar lesions, if you have bipolar lesions, you've had more instability events. So there's clearly a cost to recurrence and more instability events are more of these loss. And this is typically what we find. And these were our cohort of 200 instability patients. 5% had more of this acute bone injury. Most of them were in this attritional bone loss, two to seven episodes, and more than 10 episodes was very severe, 30 to 45%. So last, lastly, I just want to talk the other things we see with recurrence. And it's very clear we have all of these things happening if you have a recurrent injury. And so more bone, more bone loss and more labral tears. If you look at Shin's work, there's no question you get more prevalence of labrum tears. If you look at others, Dickens, Zhang, and others, if you have recurrence, 13.5% or more, 
no recurrence or N of 1 instability event, less than 13.5 on average. You get larger hill sacs lesions, more recurrence, and it confounded the instability. More capsular injuries, more capsular stretch, more capsular volume that shows up after instability. And this is our article that looked at uh, if you had anterior with recurrence, you had a much higher volumetric arthrogram ability to put in pressure-limited arthrogram fluid. So we know that the capsular stretch was there when you had recurrence. You also have more GLAD tears, more ALPSA, and more cartilage lesions. And we do know that uh, ALPSAs and GLAD lesions are actually not good in terms of arthroscopic stabilizations. The recurrences are much higher. And if you look at uh, our work here, ALPSA had twice the amount of bone loss. You also had uh, more, uh, more risk factors for off-track lesions and other issues. I just lastly want to talk, it was asked about treatment algorithm. Well, we know how to do this really well, and uh, thank you, Dr. Yamamoto and others, for giving us the glenoid track concept. It's wonderful and because we can't think about the glenoid in isolation. We have to think about a bipolar lesion, and we're learning a lot from this. This is a cadaver study, but it's uh, actually easy to remember, and we're actually now clinically validated this in numerous studies. Uh, we looked at this back in 2013, where we actually validated this and looked at uh, clinical application for uh, anterior instability. We're really able to predict recurrence when using these uh, simple measurements of the glenoid tract. And then Giovanni and others have shown us a lot about this in terms of how they're additive and what to do in 2022. And Giovanni, thank you for these wonderful videos and pictures to help us understand this better. But in essence, if you're less than 25%, and this number is probably controversial now, given that this, I think it's going down more and more, maybe it's 15% or 20%, but on track, arthroscopic, off track, maybe arthroscopic plus remplissage, and there's certainly argument to add remplissage to everything now because of the much better, uh, re less recurrence rate. And if you're much higher, you're looking at ladder J and or free bone graft, and certainly here in the United States, I know other places that have access, the distal tibia has been a wonderful graft for us to really match the shoulder well, uh, and as well as adding in the talus for larger heel sacs lesion and tailor plugs or tailor slices. So when you're fixing this by scope, we want to make sure we're doing this uh, arthroscopically well. You can see this is a very big lesion here, but when you're doing this uh, overall in the bank cart and remplissage recurrence rate and latter recurrence rate, but bank cart and remplissage you can get quite well. And latter the more you look at it, the more you investigate it in the literature, it's really good. But when you look at the recurrence, latter recurrence is probably anywhere from 4 to 15%. It's not uh, as good as we may think. It's, it's very good. But we still, I think, have work to do and really understanding who needs what. So in conclusion, uh, there is a cost to recurrence. And you may want to stabilize your athlete earlier because there is a cost. Things happen. Most athletes can return to sport, and a lot of them will want to. And so those are individual decisions. But when you have recurrence, you get more le bony lesions, more bone loss, more labrum tears, more off-track lesions. And with that, I want to thank you for your time. And Giovanni, I appreciate you putting this together. It's an honor. Thank you, Matt. Uh, just two more minutes because I have a question to ask you. Uh, last night, I came back from New Orleans where there was the ANA, and I have to say that I was really impressed, favorably impressed, by the use of the remplissage over the past few years. In particular, I've noticed, and then we will have the opportunity to, to, to talk about this, that remplissage is used not just to the bank at plus lesion, but also many colleagues who love bone block. They can use remplissage and bone block. And there are some colleagues who perform remplissage plus latarge. So this is an extremely interesting topic that shows that many of us trust uh, this uh, remplissage of the hill sacs. But the question is, uh, I'd like to show you a video. And the question, Matt, has to do with the bony bank cut lesions. We have done some studies together about the bony bank cut. So when we have the fragment type, the fragment type which detaches not just the capsule ligamentous part, but also a fragment of bone. Why is this observation interesting? And I'd like to know what you think, 
basically in a first episode with a bony bunker. What do you do? Because many studies from Japan and other researchers have found out that this bone fragment in one year becomes smaller by 50%. So if we repair lately a patient, it means that we will have a smaller fragment, which means that we will have a smaller platform. So a lesion which can be off track. And we should not forget that waiting, as you correctly said, might also lead to a higher number of dislocations. And these dislocations interfere with the glenoid bone loss. What is your philosophy when you have a first time dislocation and a bony bone cut? Giovanni, first of all, congratulations on that wonderful video. This is something you and I have talked many times about, which is the attritional bone loss, ABL. Not just glenoid bone loss, but attritional bone loss, which we found can set in as early as six to eight weeks after an instability event. And that's a huge problem because you think you have that bone that can reconstruct the glenoid, but it's not there. And even if it's there, it's very soft. So to your question, I like fixing these early. And in fact, that's why, at least on the NFL field, the football field in the United States, we have x-rays at all the stadium. If they have a shoulder injury, dislocation, et cetera, they're probably not coming back in the same game, but the x-ray right away can help us decide if they need surgery or not. Why? You have a bony fragment. If they have a bony fragment, for me, it's surgery right away and they're not coming back because we can get a beautiful repair and or repair of that anatomic fragment using a variety of techniques, all anchor techniques, anchor plus small handles compression screws or whatever you like to use in a very nice arthroscopic manner and you're able to reconstruct it. In addition, uh, the hill sacs generally is pretty small because you haven't had recurrence. So whether or not you had a remplissage into that is controversial, but it's a very good it's a very good topic. And I've done a lot of remplissage with with bone procedures as well. So that's a whole nother topic, but certainly something to think about. But I like fixing these early. Matt, ti ringraziamo e ti salutiamo. Matt, thank you very much. Uh, goodbye from Rome, and we'll meet in San Diego in a few weeks. Uh, thank you very much again Ciao. for uh, you. your availability. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Ciao. Grazie. Buonasera. Grazie anche per tutte queste informazioni. Thank you very much also for this uh, wealth of information, uh, which becomes clearer and clearer as we keep organizing these meetings, even for people like me. I'm not a shoulder surgeon. Now, let's move on. Uh, Dr. Nobu Yamamoto is with us now. Good evening. Uh, you are a consultant at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Tohoku University School of Medicine. Sorry about the pronunciation. Uh, you have been there since 2009. You are associate professor. You won many awards, 22 awards, uh, the best poster of the Amer American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery and the best poster from the European Society of uh, Shoulder and Elbow. You also published 131 scientific articles, 63 chapters in books, 54 reviews. So really, uh, you uh, are very active in your field. Before giving you the floor, I'd like to say it's 4 a.m., correct? Did you yes. sleep a few hours? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> What do you think you're doing? At the end of this meeting, are you going to go to bed or are you going to study or do what? Uh, I want to go to bed again. <laughs> Nobu, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I apologize. Uh, because in my crazy things about the shoulder during the weekend or during the day, I send emails to Nobu because I'd like to talk to him uh, together with Ishi Toy on fragment type uh, and many other topics. Uh, we always have quite a lot to learn and it is really stimulating to talk to Nobu and Tuibi. Thank you very much. And now you have the floor about the biomechanics of glenohumeral instability. You have the floor. Okay, I will share my slide.
Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. Uh, I'm Nobuyuki Yamamoto from Tokyo University, Sendai, Japan. It's my great honor to talk about shoulder biomechanics. This is a video of the wrestling game. Please look at the uh, lead player. He was strong. He has a break at this time. In his case, dislocation position is elevation position. It is generally believed dislocation position is abduction and external rotation position, but it's not always true. There are many dislocation position. Look at the literature. The Schwab reported most common dislocation position was hyperflexion or abduction, 36%. Abduction and axon rotation was just 21%. So mid-range injury is more common than we expected. Arthroscopic bunker repair is a very much reasonable procedure because we repair essential lesion. Look at the literature. Recurrence rate is very good, less than 20%. Our clinical data also showed a good clinical result. The current rate was 6%. There was a shocking paper for me when I was a young doctor. Buckhout reported even after bunker repair, if patient has an embodied pear glenoid, which means large glenoid defect, the current rate is very high, 67%. But why unstable even after bunker repair? During bunker repair, we repair the essential region. To answer this question, let's think about the shoulder stability. Shoulder stability depends on the arm position. There are two positions, end range and mid range. End range is the abduction and external rotation. Mid range is other position. At the end range, ligament became towed and contributed to the stability. IGHL became towed and prevent femoral head translate anteriorly. If there is a bunker lesion, femoral head dislocate anteriorly like this. On the other hand, at the mid range, ligament is lax. It doesn't contribute to the stability. Instead for that, interarticular pressure and muscle contribute to the stability at the mid range. In this video, the, the needle is inside the joint. If I open the three-way stopcock, femoral head dislocates inferiorly. By this simple experiment, we are able to know that interarticular pressure contribute to the stability. Another Stabilizing mechanism is concavity compression effect. Femur head is compressed to the glenoid concavity by rotator cuff muscles. It is well known the glenoid is very much the shallow concavity. We measure the glenoid depth, it's just 2.4 millimeter. But this shallow glenoid concavity is important in terms of the shoulder stability. If there is a glenoid defect, femoral head dislocate anteriorly at the mid range. That's why if patient has an embodied pear glenoid, large glenoid defect, the current rate is very high. Glenoid defect and heel sac lesion are common injury associated with anterior shoulder instability, and its incidence is very high, 86% and 94% respectively. Bipolar lesion is a combination of the glenoid defect and the heel sac lesion, and its incidence is also very high, 81%. We need to consider bone loss in addition to the soft tissue. When considering treatment of the glenoid defect, we just think about glenoid defect. 
because it is related to the mid-range stability. At the mid-range, ligament is relax, so we just consider the glenoid defect. On the other hand, when considering the treatment of the shear sac region, we need to consider the bipolar region. This heel sac region is safe because uh, which is located within contact area, no risk of engagement. However, if there is a glenoid defect, engagement occur easily. So we, we need to consider the bipolar region like this. So how to evaluate a heel sac region? If you evaluate your engagement during surgery, it's not correct because before bunker repair, femur head translates anteriorly easily and the engagement occur easily. Look at the literature. If you evaluate the engagement during surgery, its incidence is very high, 27% to 43%. We should evaluate the risk of engagement before surgery. So how to evaluate the heel sac lesion? We resolve the heel sac lesion. This heel sac lesion is very wide, but no risk of engagement. How about the depth? This heel sac lesion is deep, but no risk of engagement. The most important point is the relative location of the medial margin of the heel sac lesion. We have proposed the concept of the glenoid track. Glenoid track is a zone of contact of the glenoid on the femur head. The width of the glenoid track was demonstrated to be 83% of the glenoid width in vivo MRI study. We can evaluate the glenoid defect and the Hussack region together. In the literature, glenoid defect and heel sac lesion are considered separately. However, if you use a glenoid track concept, we are able to evaluate both lesions at the same time. Giovanni developed this concept and he named engaged heel sac lesion off track lesion and non engaging heel sac lesion off track lesion. Now, there are two types of the glenoid defect fragment type and erosion type. Erosion type, is it really bony erosion? If so, there should be no wear debris. But we have never seen such a wear debris in the CT image. Look at the literature. There are many studies describing the shoulder dislocation, but few description about the mechanism of bone loss. Then we perform the biomechanical study. Now, first, we need to develop the dislocation device. This is custom dislocation device, intense fire, magnetic sensor, and the air compressor. We use the air cylinder. By using this air cylinder, we are able to apply maximum of 100 program at high speed. Don't speak when there is the video. Second. We cannot hear you during the video. Sun, knee, each. And the femur head is pulled by the 800 Newton. Sun, knee. Finally, we could successfully create a dislocation model. Bony bunker lesion and Hussack lesion and glenoid defect. And uh, this is a bony fragment. The glenoid limb was pulled by the IGHL, so always the same location as the attachment of the IGHL. IGHL is attached to the glenoid bone loss, bone, and the abulsion type and the fragment type is different. Abulsion type, the shape of the abulsion type is always including the smallest articular surface of the bone. Here are data of the 15 shoulder in our series. 60% bunker lesion, 27% bony bunker, and 13% capsular tear. Fragment type can be divided into two, fracture type and the abulsion type. Fracture type, during dislocation, 
granular limb fracture occur. But aversion type is different. Keeping central petal position, femoral head compressed to the granoid, and the horizontal extension is forced. And then the granoid limb was pulled by the IGA chair and the aversion fracture occur. So fracture type and aversion type, different uh, injury mechanism each other. This is fluoroscopy image of the aversion type. You can see the fragment here. Is bone loss created during dislocation? If so, anterior margin of the granoid should be curved, but it's not curved. It's always straight in the 3D CT image like this. So we hypothesize bone loss is created after dislocation, not during dislocation. After dislocation, female head is compressed to the granoid, Q-sac region is created and the granular limb is also compressed. We confirmed it in a biomechanical study. Then finally created the granular uh, compression fracture and we performed the histologic analysis. This is HS staining, posterior and anterior. You can see the cortex here and the collapse of the trabecular bone. Also, you can see the fracture line. In our ex uh, institute, uh, we have our animal experiment center. There, micro CT device they have. This is micro CT image, posterior and anterior. And you can see the collapse of the trabecular bone. So this is not erosion but a compression fracture. In summary, a large bone loss is a risk factor for recurrence. When think about the treatment of the Hussack region, we should consider the bipolar region and the granular tract concept is useful. Erosion type granular bone loss is not erosion, it's a compression fracture. And we propose another type of the granular fragment a version type. Thank you for your attention. Um, grazie, grazie a lei. Thank you, thank you very much. I have to ask you something. Just please wait before you go to bed because we would like <laughs> you to remain with us until the end of this evening so that we can have the Q&A session at the end. Is that a problem? Can you do that? Oh, yes, okay. sure. I will, I will wait. I will see. Bene, you. bene, bene. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll try not to bore you. And now, let's move on. Professor Philip Moroder at the Shelter List in Zurich in Switzerland. Good evening. And uh, he is an expert in shoulder and elbow surgery. He has taken part in the Search and Traveling Fellowship in different centers of excellence in the United States of America from 2018 to 2021. He was also the director of the Department of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery at the University Hospital Charité in Berlin. And he also received uh, many awards for his research. And since 2021, he has been a member of the executive committee of the European Shoulder and Elbow Society. Right, now, at this point, uh, Giovanni Di Giacomo, you have the floor. Philip, uh, you know uh, the uh, how we consider you. You have published many things, many papers, you made uh, Cla different classifications. You have developed the scientific interest uh, concerning posterior instability. So it's really an honor to give you the floor. And again, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. You have the floor. Good evening, dear friends in Rome. Uh, thank you especially to Giovanni for inviting me for a second time to be part of a Shoulder Channel TV event. It's wonderful what you built there, my friend. So let me dive into my slides for one second. So let's see. Let's 
So I hope you can see my slides that is started. Otherwise, please interrupt me and let me know. Yeah. Okay. It's perfect. Go ahead. I would like to point out some disclosures uh, as I might be a little bit conflicted during parts of my talk, and I would like to point this out. So sometimes in clinical practice, we observe patients that dislocate their shoulder, not only when they have a trauma, but every time when they raise their hand. And you can clearly see this on the fluoroscopic image on the upper right hand side. However, as opposed to the problems that were shown by Nobu and Matt Provencher before, you cannot see anything on MRI. There's no structural defect at all, yet these patients have the most severe type of instability that you witness in your clinical practice. So the question remains, why can this happen? If there's no structural defects, why are these patients so unstable? And the explanation is that we often do not consider the muscles. So in cases where there is muscle hyperactivity or muscle hyperactivity, this can lead to a very severe type of shoulder instability. And I like to call this functional shoulder instability as opposed to structural shoulder instability that my colleagues talked about before. Who is affected? It's mostly teenagers and young adults, and the prevalence is quite high. We did a study and found 0.5 to 2.6% of the medical university students are able to dislocate their shoulder voluntarily. And the beginning of the initial symptoms is quite young, around 11 to 15 years. So if we want to classify these types of functional shoulder instability, there's two big groups. There's positional functional shoulder instability, and then there is non-positional functional shoulder instability. And essentially, this goes in all directions, anterior, posterior, or multidirectional. So let's start off with positional shoulder instability, and there is a controllable version of this positional instability. If you look at this patient, she has a very nice shoulder motion. There's no sign of instability. However, if she wants to, she can change her muscle activation pattern. And you will see in a second how she is able to dislocate her shoulder at will. This is a position depending but controllable functional shoulder instability, as you can clearly see on the fluoroscopic images. Let's move to the other version of positional functional shoulder instability. This is the non-controllable version. You can see this patient, she dislocates every time she elevates her arm and she cannot control it. And you can clearly also see this on the fluoroscopic images. So it's the same pathology as I just showed before. However, she cannot control it. Then there is the other big group called non-positional functional shoulder instability. Again, there is the distinguishment between controllable and non-controllable subtypes of non-positional instability. You can see a patient who can control how she dislocates her shoulder at the neutral position. So she doesn't have to move her arm, yet she can dislocate her shoulder posteriorly quite easily, as you can see on the video and on the fluoroscopic images. At the same time, unfortunately, there is a non-controllable version of this pathology. And you can see this in this patient. Uh, if she only releases her arm from her stomach or from her belly, she continues to have repetitive dislocations, which she cannot control. It almost looks like a tick-like pathology. So what about the direction of this instability? As these patients are usually referred as uh, multidirectional instability cases, as they look very weird if you look at them in a clinical perspective. But if we actually took a case series of more than 30 patients of, uh, of, that suffer from this pathology and analyzed them under fluoroscope, what we saw is that the majority of the patients were multidirectionally lax. And uh, Philippe Valenti is going to talk about this uh, later on. However, most of them had a unidirectional instability and dislocation direction. The most important thing is that there's a big difference in clinical presentation between the controllable conditions and the non-controllable conditions. If you look at the impairment these patients suffer from, as long as this is controllable, they do not suffer almost at all. They have no limitations in their daily activities and sports activities. However, once these pathologies turn non-controllable, these patients, these often young patients, suffer extensively. So in the past, we shoulder surgeons uh, have claimed these patients to be crazy. And this has been written in black and white in several publications. So what we did is we tried to analyze the same cohort of patients, more than 30 patients suffering from functional shoulder instability, with a psychological screening score. And what we found is that these patients have no change psychological attitude towards a control group. 
So this obviously is a very, sorry about that, it's a very debilitating pathology in the young, but nonetheless, it is not their fault in terms of this being a psychiatric disease, which has been claimed in the past. However, it might still be caused by a brain malfunction. So there has been a very nice study was conducted in Great Britain where they looked at the brain activation pattern in patients suffering from functional shoulder instability. And what they found is that these patients suffer from an activation pattern very similar to toddlers. They're trying to learn a new motor task. So what can we do for these patients? If it's controllable, don't do anything. Just counsel a patient and tell them not to stress this instability because it might turn into a non-controllable situation. If you have a non-controllable condition, surgery should not be the primary option as the outcome might be good, but it also might be terrible and cause severe pain and early degenerative changes. It's not predictable, essentially. So physiotherapy remains the gold standard. There's another option, which is skillful neglect, because we realized that physiotherapy, unfortunately, in many cases did not lead to the results that we desired. So in other uh, cases, in other studies, they figured out that this is a pathology of the young and that might diminish over time over the decades. But typically, these young patients don't want to wait for 20 years until they get better. They want a solution now and want to return to their lives, uh, which is why, uh, together with an Italian company, we developed an electrical muscle stimulator that is uh, triggered by motion in order to try to treat these patients suffering from functional shoulder instability, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a few seconds. So the gold standard for treatment of functional shoulder instability is still non-operative treatment. And this needs to be very specific, dedicated exercise protocols, enabling uh, to activate hyperactive muscle groups and to deactivate hyperactive muscle groups. So how can this be done? This is just an example of a patient with a positional functional shoulder instability. You can clearly see how she dislocates posteriorly. She cannot even return her arm back uh, down because she is dislocated. And if you use a device, the so-called shoulder pacemaker, which is motion activated and stimulates the hyperactive muscles based on the position of the arm in space, you can see how her shoulder is able to recenter and she doesn't dislocate anymore. How does this look for the patient that we already saw? You can see that she's outside of the regular movement pattern with her scapular kinematics when she is unstable. So what you can do is you can actually use this motion triggered electrical muscle stimulator and you can do very dynamic exercises. And while she's doing her exercises, you can see how you're able to return her scapular kinematics within a normal range pattern. And at the beginning, I thought this needs to be an implantable device. However, we figured out that after a certain period of training, something changes. It might be a neuroplastic effect in the brain that allows these patients to learn the new muscle activation pattern. And this leads to improved outcome. We saw in a randomized controlled trial that compared the shoulder pacemaker versus conventional physiotherapy, that there is an improved outcome if you use the motion triggered electrical muscle stimulator with better VOSI score, better stability, less discomfort, higher subjective improvement and patient satisfaction. And even if the patients crossed over from the physiotherapy group to the shoulder pacemaker aided physiotherapy group, we saw a significant improvement in these patients. This is an example of a patient uh, three months after conventional physiotherapy, and she did not do very well. She was still unstable. So we switched her, we crossed her over to the other treatment arm, and this treatment arm consists of the exact same physiotherapeutic exercises, but with concomitant stimulation uh, using the shoulder pacemaker. And what we found is that at the six-point time, Mark, you can see how she does much better and is able to return to sports quite nicely. And this is sustained over the one-year period. And she sent us this video proving that she is doing better and having a stable shoulder. So what about non-positional functional shoulder instability? Uh, this is a very, very difficult topic for me. And uh, for, for many years, I've been struggling with this and I still continue to struggle with it. So this is a patient with static anterior inferior dislocation. You can clearly see this also on the clinical images, how a shoulder is anterior inferiorly dislocated. And this is after two times failed arthroscopic anterior bank cut repair. But actually, it was an anterior and anterior inferior and posterior inferior capsular shift procedure. So she had extensive surgery twice. It did not help. She has the static dislocations now since a long time period. What is amazing about this case is if you now 
push the humeral head into the socket again and just grab her pectoralis major and pinch it really hard and then release the arm again, her shoulder magically recenters and she's not able to dislocate it anymore. And our neurologist actually saw an increased activation pattern of the pectoralis major pass abdominalis in positions where it should not be firing. So, and the most interesting part about this case was that before surgery, what you can see is if you pull on the arm, it dislocates, but if you release the arm, it just recenters automatically. So this also seems to be a muscle activation pattern issue, even though these patients obviously also had the glenoid defect as was seen and visible on the preoperative x-rays. I encountered another one of these cases not so much time ago, you can see this patient that had a static anterior dislocation after twice failed Bankert and Latouche procedure. You can see her humeral head riding on the Latouche. And what I do here is I try to recenter the humeral head with my fingers. And you can see how her pectoralis major is trying to pull out the humeral head very hard as I'm trying to, to push against it. And there is a very nice publication, a couple of years old, published in the JSCS coming from a Scandinavian uh, group. No, it's actually from the United Kingdom. Sorry about that. And what they showed, and this is amazing, is they had these patients with static anterior dislocation and they injected some Botox into the pectoralis major. And what, you, what is the outcome? You can see on the, on the images right below, they recentered a static dislocated joint with Botox. So I tried this with these patients as well, because I wanted obviously to test if this works in my hands as well. And you can see the MRI scan of this patient, which showed uh, a center joint at least for a short period of time. So in summary, functional shoulder instability is much more common than we expected. And functional shoulder instability can truly result in severe instability, despite hardly any structural defects visible on MRI or CT scan. Often this pathology is misinterpreted as multidirectional instability when reality is a multidirectional laxity with unidirectional instability. And functional shoulder instability, in my opinion, should be treated by addressing muscle hyperactivity and hyperactivity first by using new therapy concepts before deploying the traditional surgical stabilization techniques that we use and love for structural shoulder instability. Thank you very much. Due cose. La prima, devo chiederle se può. Um, Two things. Uh, can I ask you to please wait? Uh, because in the end, uh, we will have a QA session. The second thing, just out of personal curiosity, this treatment with Botox, uh, how frequently has to be repeated? Because Botox is going to be absorbed. Expensive experience with these uh, patients because they are not so frequent, luckily but uh, typically it wears off after a few months. So this is more used as a diagnostic test. Okay. If it works, then you might consider releasing these muscles via surgical intervention if you're not able to hyperactivate it uh, via some kind of physiotherapeutic intervention. Benissimo, benissimo. Very good. Thank you. So you uh, can wait until the end, and now, the floor to Philip Valenti. Since 1985, he started his experience of uh, shoulder surgery. Uh, good evening, and... Uh, so, you worked with Didier Pat, the founder of the European Shoulder Society, and then you worked in the SOS main clinic in Paris, which you founded in 1990, and then the Institute where you worked started from 1995. You are an expert in prosthetic surgery, and in 2003, you created the universal shoulder surgery, arthroscopic surgery for sport and degenerative pathologies. Uh, Dr. Valenti works uh, at the Shoulder Institute in Paris, and he also has a website which explains all the modern techniques of uh, surgery, arthroscopy, prosthesis, and tendon transfer. Dr. Di Giacomo. Philippe, first of all, I'd like to thank you. I have the privilege uh, to have learned quite a lot from you. Philippe Valenti is also a friend. I've had the opportunity to meet him in the four corners of the world. Recently, we met in Salt Lake City, 
two or three months ago during the American Academy in Las Vegas. Welcome, and thank you very much for your availability to teach us. Uh, thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Giovanni, and uh, thank you for TV Shoulder, because this is a very nice uh, opportunity to learn and to progress, to evaluate your result, and uh, thank you for all the organization. I will share my, uh, my slides. Do you hear me, uh, Giovanni? Is it okay, Giovanni? Yeah. 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 Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, today today I talk about a difficult problem in the shoulder in no, the slide non si vede, no? We cannot see your slide. Can you please share your screen? Sorry. Sorry, I share. Okay. Oh, let's see. Perfect. Okay, now. Okay, now. Thank you. Okay. It is a difficult problem when... Uh, you examine a patient with a instability of the shoulder on hyperlaxity. This is my disclosure. It's the reason why my outline today is to define instability and to define hyperlaxity, mm -hmm. to explain my clinical examination and uh, the treatment options. So if you talk about instability, instability is a subluxation or dislocation. This is a pathological uh, fact and uh, instability could be unidirectional, anterior, posterior, inferior. Sometimes this is bidirectional, anterior, inferior, or posterior, inferior. And very rare, this is a multidirectional instability, two, five percent. And uh, with this bonilation, for example, with uh, anterior it sucks, posterior it sucks, and uh, bonilation. So if you talk about hyperlaxity, it's not pathological, but it's frequently because it's 10% of the population, mainly is a female, adolescent, teenager, and there is a familial history. The definition is an excessive range of motion in all the planes because there is a distension of the capsule and ligaments increasing the volume of the joint. And if you are hyperlax, you have a risk of instability. And it is very important for the treatment that instability is combined with hyperlaxity in 5 to 50%. If we talk about the clinical examination of hyperlaxity, the definition of anterior hyperlaxity is the external rotation in position one is more than. 85 degrees or 90 degrees. It was defined by Gilles Valch a long time ago. If you have a circle sign in neutral rotation, you have an inferior hyperlaxity on Philip show many cases like that. Posterior instability with a JER test positive. Sometimes there is a bidirectional instability, anterior on inferior or posterior on inferior. Very rare, but there is some case like that, a multidirectional hyperlaxity, more than two directions of hyperlaxity. I show you this case. You see that there is hypermobility. The patient is asymptomatic. There is no, not pathological. There is a very high capsular redundancy in many directions, of course doesn't need any treatment, no arthroscopy, no capsular shift, no bony graft. is not pathological. And I think that we have to divide hyperlaxity because the treatment is completely different. There is a, a group of constitutional hyperlaxity. If this hyperlaxity is isolated to one shoulder, many times two shoulder, the elbow, you can treat this patient. But if there is a general hyperlaxity that Ehlers Danlos syndrome or hypermobility uh, structural disorder, this is a very risky patient. And take care when you propose a treatment for this kind of patient because 
the result is less predictable. Another group that you, you know very well, the tennis players, the overhead athlete, you have, after many years of sport, you have accurate hyperlaxity with sometimes an instability. And this is not a risky patient, but we have to treat soft tissue plus bony lesion. So characterized anatomical uh, lesion of this patient with instability on hyperlaxity, there is no major glenoid bone loss. Sometimes there is heel sac lesion, but the problem is a soft tissue for this patient. There is a hypoplastic labrum, glenoid dysplasia, no concavity. Many times there is a convex mole. There is an enlarged capsule volume. And sometimes you have a slap lesion or tear of the labrum. Another point very important is that for inferior succession with inferior or anterior hyperlaxity with a sulcus sign, the patients complain with a brachial plexus stretching. And this is a big problem for the young patient with uh, dysesthesia in the hand. And when you reduce the sub inferior subluxation, you reduce the black brachial plexus stretching. So hyperlaxity, if you consider the treatment of the shoulder instability, is a predictive factor of failure of soft tissue repair. And it's very it's a crucial when you do examination of an instable shoulder to evaluate if the patient is hyperlax or not hyperlax. So there is two group of patients if we talk about the treatment. If you have instability with hyperlaxity isolated, I think that if you reduce the capsule, if you restore the concavity to repair the labrum, and after to avoid recurrence, because this is hyperlax and instable, is recommended to do additional stabilizator. You can augment the capsule with a tendon, you can close the rotator interval, or you can use a TRIA procedure or LATAGE procedure, and you can obtain a success result of 90%. If you don't do additional augmentation, if you have a hyperlax with anterior instability, the risk of frequency is uh, around 50%. So this is a very difficult problem. And uh, I think that take care for this kind of patient. If you have Marfan or Ehlers syndrome, whatever you do, the success is less predictable. I show you here a case of a conservative. And I think that the most important is to propose a conservative treatment. And uh, Philippe uh, Moroder explained very well the shoulder pacemaker. And always for this kind of patient, I try physiotherapy, shoulder pacemaker. And after, if I have a failure, I try to do a pancapsular shift arthroscopy with a capsular augmentation and, or bone block. But many times in my experience, it's not successful. And I have some patients I, I propose after two or three surgery, arthrodesis of, or reverse arthroplasty. I show you a catastrophic case of me, uh, 21 years old, Eder Danlos syndrome, hyperlaxity, anterior stability. I did a latarge arthroscopy with Bancart. And after a few months, you see that there is a inferior subluxation and posterior subluxation on this location. I did a posterior bone graft, it was not enough. The patient was complained always with painful or I propose after a fusion of the glenoidal joint. So this is a, we have some case like that on the take care when you treat this kind of patient. If you have a instability with a isolated laxity, I think that you try always conservative treatment and uh, after a failure, you can do a capsular shift on the augmentation with a TRIA in my experience when there is an anterior inferior instability with hyperlaxity or latarge. So I will, would like to show you this patient. It's, it's, it's typical. You see, very young woman. She has a dyskinesia of the scapula. 
on the posterior dislocation of the shoulder. Look at in this position. There is a correction of the posterior stability. There's a correction of the posterior stability. And it's very important. My message is when you have a patient with a posterior stability on hyperlaxity, you have to examine the scapula because many times there is a dyskinesia of the scapula. The cause is sometimes a pectoris minor hyperactivity. I agree with Philip regarding the pectoris major, but many times hypoactivity of the lower trapezius on infraspinatus. And this is a typical case that don't do any operation, physiotherapy, shoulder pacemaker device. And in 90% of my experience, you treat this patient and she will be very happy. And I think that we have to consider not the shoulder, you have to consider the scapulotoracic joint, the shoulder, the glenohumeral joint, lower trapezius, infraspinatus, and anteriorly pectoris minor and pectoris major. And if you identify all this muscle on all these joints, you have to you choose a good solution for this patient. So we publish a, a series of 14 patients with uh, anterior instability, with uh, subluxation or dislocation, and anterior hyperlaxity. We excluded, of course, LR Downer syndrome, and we did. Uh, capsuloplasty, anterior and inferior, on osteoclasia of the coracoid process. And the coracoid process is lower on medalize to increase the positioning of the conjunct tendon and to reinforce the inferior part of the subscapularis in abduction. This is a very old technique in 1954 by Tria, and uh, I am very happy because I did 14 cases with more follow-up three years, no recurrent dislocation, good function, no pain, and uh, we can you we can do by arthroscopy with a, on the button on the, with a good uh, healing of the coracoid process. This is a good augmentation of the capsuloplasty for anterior and inferior dislocation when the patient is hyperlax. We reduce uh, the forward elevation 10 degrees on external rotation. This is the morbidity of this uh, operation. So my uh, recommendation for this pathology and is very risky for us, uh, instability on hyperlaxity, you should always look for hyperlaxity when you do clinical examination of uh, instability of the shoulder, don't take the wrong direction of instability. It's not so easy to do the difference between anterior and posterior instability if the patient is hyperlax. And hyperlax is, for me, is more complicated to examine instability. Keep a place for conservative treatment. Always for adolescent, no painful, posterior dislocation with dyskinesia of the scapulothoracic joint with hypo or hyperactivity of the muscle, keep a place for shoulder pacemaker of Philip Moroder. Instability on hyperlaxity isolated, capsuloplasty, capsular shift, repair the labrum, you do a very well bank out and, and you augment because it's a pathologic soft tissue. You can augment with a tendon, with a bone, with a plicature of the rotator interval as you want, but is, the concept of augmentation is very uh, useful when there is instability or hyperlaxity. And take care to the uh, hypermorbidity uh, structural disorder, LR Danlos syndrome, Marfran syndrome, because in my hand, there is no reliable solution. Thank you a lot, Giovanni, and I invite you in Paris next year for the arthroplasty shoulder course. Uh, I will do with Marcus and uh, Jean-David, and of course, I invite you uh, to talk about arthroplasty. Thank you a lot. Grazie. Yeah.
Grazie, Filippo. Thank you, thank you, Filippo. Really exceptional. Please, five more minutes. Five minutes for questions. I have three questions. Let's start. Let's start with one of those questions to Dr. Yamamoto. Asking a question to Dr. Yamamoto is really an honor for me, especially considering that it's 5 a.m. So thank you very much for uh, sticking with us. So let's start from the concept we saw before. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, you for the concept of renal track with the contribution of Steve Burkhardt uh, and Dr. Di Giacomo. This has become uh, one of the gold standards uh, for the assessment of instability, which is an integral part of our world. So it's really important. The cutoff is 83% of the glenoid surface. And many of our works and many of our decision-making processes are based on that when we decide what is the best intervention on our patients. But we found out that a concept that is so important can also be improved. And in fact, it was interesting to see that there are some criteria, some parameters of variability of the glenoid track. It's not always 83% of the glenoid surface, and there are some parameters, some criteria, which can change it according to the patient. And the three parameters and basically correspond to the position of the arm in space, 83% of the glenoid, but at the end range, the glenoid track reduces its size. This is a very important key point that helps us understand what are the most critical points in the movement of the patient when the patient can risk again to have a problem. Then there is another element which might vary from one patient to another is the capsular ligament laxity. That is, according to the degree of capsular ligament laxity, the glenoid tract can have a different value. So it can be reduced. And this is very important because in the decision-making process leading to one type of surgery rather than another, these are all parameters that have to be studied for classification purposes. The third parameter is also the position of the scapulothoracic joint because the head of the humerus on the glenoid, but the glenoid can have different positions. As Philippe Moroda said, from the functional point of view, the glenoid can change its behavior and its position compared to the head of the humerus. And this can be another important parameter in the assessment of our patients in order to better understand and make a forecast of the outcome after surgery. So, what is the question? Uh, can you tell us what you are studying now? What is the literature studying now about what I've just told you? Yes, thank you for your uh, question. And uh, it's a very good point. And uh, as you said, the granular tract is affected by the joint laxity and the range of motion. And uh, we need to consider the especially relaxity and uh, to investigate the relationship between granular track and the range of motion or joint relaxity. And we uh, measure the uh, granular track virus uh, changing the uh, range of motion. And uh, among various range of motion, the, we found horizontal extension is affect the granular tract virus most. We did a in vivo study and biomechanical study. We did both. And uh, we found horizontal extension motion affect the granular tract most. Then we made a granular tract table, which showed the relationship between granular track virus and the horizontal extension angle. For example, if one patient has a 10 degree of a horizontal extension angle, his granular track virus is 81%, uh, something like that. Then by using this granular track table, we are able to know the individual granular track virus. 
So we propose the glenoid tract virus, uh, the in clinical use. It's very simple and easy to do, use. Grazie. Thank you. Let's move on to another question. I have a question for our French friend, Philippe Valenti. France, uh, in France, uh, you, you love the Latarget technique. The Latarget technique is used uh, in uh, critical bone loss, more than 20, 25%, and it uses a series of effects which work in mid-range and end-range. That is, the support uh, of transplant, uh, but also the sling effect, this compression of the subscapularis that is due to the common tendon in abduction and external rotation stabilizes the shoulder. The question I'd like to ask you starts from the concept introduced by Tokish, that is the subcritical glenoid loss. He published some works in which he described the subcritical glenoid loss. What did Tokish say? Well, he said that in subjects, in the Marines, or contact sport subjects. If we perform a bank cut repair in subjects with a glenoid bone loss between 13.5% and 20%, there is no increase in recurrence, but uh, the clinical result is not good. The WOSI is 500, 600. So the question is, how can it be possible that surgeons who love the bone block, and I'm going to show you this video now. So what happens? The bone block, Yamamoto and Ishii taught us, the bone is the stabilize, stabilizer in the mid-range. But those who use bone block, they are going to repair the bone cut on a large bone deficit, which might be a subcritical bone loss. So the capsule is repaired on a glenoid bone loss of 16 to 17%. So it is in tension again. Now, at the end range of motion, the capsule only works. How can it be that these subjects that perform bankart and bone graft have good woesy results? If we compare this with John Tokish, I understand it's a very complex question, but uh, I think it's very important because the bone block uh, is becoming more and more popular. But basically, the question is, if we repair the bank card on a subcritical bone loss, because this is the indication for the bone block, if we repair a capsule, a bank card lesion on 16% of glenoid bone loss, this might lead to a limit of a range of motion, so a bad WOSI score, even if there is a bone block that works in the mid-range. Philip, do you want to answer this question, or do you have any doubts of what I've just said? No, but uh, we have to, to come back to the history of the, of the Latarge, because uh, when I learned with Didier Pat by Open Technique in 1985, we shutter the capsule to the, the stump of the AC ligament. We didn't do any bone out. We put the capsule to the AC ligament of the coracoid block. And I think that is completely different, that if you do a bone block coracoid process on the bone out, because, of course, as you explained very well, that you repair the bone cut medially and you limit the excursion of your capsule. And if you compare the result of, uh, for example, our friend Laurent Lafosse, Laurent Lafosse does a, a latarge and he removed completely the capsule. He didn't do any bone cut. And uh, this is not my way. I prefer to do a bone card to be extra articular for the bone and to avoid osteoarthritis. But when you compare the post-operative uh, follow-up of my patient on the patient of Laurent, Laurent, the patient recover 
very early a good range of motion. In my patients, I have 10 degrees of limitation of external rotation if I compare to the contralateral side. And I think that I am not sure today that the Bancard procedure, if you have a bone loss than 20%, is a good way. I prefer today a suture of the capsule to the AC ligament by arthroscopy because I think it depends on the bone loss. For the rugby player, for example, for the rugby player, in my experience, if you have no bone loss, I do a latarge plus a bone card procedure with a very nice result. But if the rugby player has a bone loss around 20% with a heel saxation, I prefer to do a latarge with a suture of the bone card, with a suture of the capsule to the AC ligament. This is my answer today, but uh, I'm not sure that is a good way, but uh, is logical not to stretch too much uh, the the capsule because I think that if you if you check postoperatively after three months, many times there is a rupture of the capsule. If you tie too much the capsule during the operation. Grazie, Philippe Moroder. Thank you, Philippe Moroder. Do you have anything to add? Uh, I don't know, in, in this type of a subcritical glenoid bone loss, do you perform latarge or bone block? And if you perform bone block, do you repair the capsule on the glenoid bone loss? What is your philosophy? Perform a free bone block uh, graft transfer, then actually you should not refix the capsule between the graft and the native glenoid. So you should not put the graft extra thickly for the exact reason that you just mentioned, because otherwise the capsule might be too short and limit range of motion. Uh, it's actually that my first teacher, Herbert Resch, he performed free bone block uh, transfer since many, many decades. And we have 15 years outcome. We have randomized controlled trials comparing his technique to Latage's at five year time point. He never fixed any capsule at all. He just let it go. He just cut it and let it be. And he has the same outcome as, as you can get with the Latagé. So actually, it does not seem so important in a patient with a critical or subcritical bone loss to fix the capsule. And if you do fix it, fix it around the graft. Don't fix it at the interface between the graft and the native glenoid. Otherwise, you will restrict motion. And you don't need to be worried as much about osteoarthritis, I think. There's a very nice study coming out of Austria, Salzburg. Uh, Alexander Aufwart has shown with MRI scans that if you have an intraarticular graft, uh, after one year, you have a remodeling of the surface and there is, all, there is fibrous cartilage formation. We even took histological samples of a bone graft in case of revision. And you cannot see these grafts uh, being uh, not covered. They are covered by some form of fibrous cartilage. And so it does not seem to be deleterious for instability of tropathy in the long range. So it can stay intraarticularly but you need to be careful to make the concavity very precise. So you need to reconstruct the concavity and you don't need to have any step-offs, obviously. Perfect. Before we say goodbye, Philip, I have a, qu a question. Uh, tell us something about posterior instability. So thank you very much. Your guidelines, your indications on the treatment of posterior instability are very important in our clinical practice. So I'd like to show you a case, a clinical case, a woman, 19 years old, professional volleyball player. This girl comes to us with a diagnosis of functional posterior instability. At the imaging, we see this diagnostic picture of flat glenoid, so a structural defect of the posterior portion of the glenoid. So my question is, these types of patients are very young. They do sports. Can we help them in terms of rehabilitation with the treatment you mentioned? Or what is the cutoff value in which we can be conservative? Or maybe they have to be operated on surgery. What is your proposal? Interesting case, and this is, uh, if you maybe are able to put the slide back up, 
showing the image of the MRI scan, I think this is a very important point. Uh, I don't know whether you can see this. Ah, perfect, thank you very much. So if you look closely at these MRI scans, you can clearly see that it's true what just has been said. This is a very flat, glenoid uh, surface. And talking about the bony surface, it might even be convex if you look at the right image. However, usually what you can find in these cases is a quite hypertrophic posterior cartilage or posterior labrum that compensates for this dysplasia, for this bony dysplasia. So also in this case, in the end, you can see, even though the bone is convex almost, you can still have a concavity by the fact that the posterior labrum is compensating for that. But admittedly, still the glenoid remains quite flat. So there's a structural insufficiency. That's not a structural defect in terms of a, a damage that was obtained by trauma, but it's more uh, insufficiency. So in my hands, this is a clear indication for a non-operative treatment attempt for three to six months. In my hands, it's the shoulder pacemaker device that I would use. If it leads to stability, great. You don't need to worry about it anymore. If it leads to instability uh, and it doesn't, um, does, get, doesn't treat, is not able to treat and stabilize the patient, then in this particular case, I would go in the direction that Philippe Valenti has shared with us. I would go for minimally invasive arthroscopic capsule labor repair and shift. It's actually not a repair, it's more a shift because it's not torn. And then after six weeks after the intervention, I would add the functional treatment because for sure, if you just operate and you don't do any adequate physiotherapy, you're not tackling the cause. So the surgery in this particular case becomes the helper of the non-operative treatment. So you need to combine both. Perfect. Allora, Perfect. So before uh, we give the floor to Vera to conclude, I would like to take this opportunity to personally thank uh, Filippo Valenti, Filippo Moroder, our friend uh, Yamamoto. I would like to thank shoulder pacemaker, top doctors and AJR. Behind the scenes, uh, they always support us and they give us the opportunity to do this sharing uh, in shoulder channel. So I'd like to thank our friends, scientists. I would also like to thank all those who allow us to do this. Thank you very much. I'd like to conclude. I'd like to thank uh, all of you all the participants for this very important scientific contribution. I would like to thank uh, Giovanni Di Giacomo, of course, uh, Elena Silvestri, and uh, enough said. Thank you very much. Good night. Dr. Yamamoto, please go back to bed now. And uh, let's say good night to everybody. Thank you very much. Goodbye. See you. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, all the team. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. Bye. Ciao. Bye. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Grazie anche al nostro traduttore. Mandiamo la pubblicità. Ah, è vero. Grazie. Così. La ringraziamo.